Hello. Welcome, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us for the launch of Platy Month 2023. I'm just going to give a really quick reminder if everyone could put on uh, mute right now so we can hear speakers. Uh, my name is Kylie, and I'm so excited to be here in Hillsville uh, with some wonderful friends of ACF um, who have been in town for a platypus conference at the Sanctuary. Um, let's begin by acknowledging that wherever you are calling in from, uh, you're on First Nations land. Sovereignty has never been ceded and treaties have not been agreed or signed. I pay my respects to elders past, present and extend this respect to any First Nations people on the call here today. I'm here on Wurundjeri country in beautiful Hillsville, which is a significant place for Wurundjeri people and for many Australians. And of course, for the Dulai Wurrung or the platypus. This is an animal that is intimately connected to the lives and lore of many First Nations. As we set upon this journey of planning month, it is really important to remember that we have a responsibility to respect and honor the unique connection that First Peoples have with Dulai Wurrung and with country. So, as I've said, my name is Kylie. I'm a massive fan of the Monotreme. I'm a local to Hillsville, and I'm the engagement project manager here at Australian Conservation Foundation. ACF is a thriving and diverse community of over half a million people right across Australia. Together, we stand up for nature, we fight for a safer climate, and we advocate for a better future for the people, animals, and the places that we love. Before we jump into an evening of platypus appreciation, I would like to recognize each and every one of you and thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us this evening. Last year was the first year that we ran the Platy Project and we were so humbled and really inspired by everybody that got involved, from the land care groups to schools, water authorities, families and scientists, and of course our absolutely amazing ACF community groups. Thank you if you took part last year and welcome if this is your first time. Okay, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. As I said before, this is a big group. There are lots and lots of people online. So if you could please make sure you mute, that would be much appreciated. Um, if you have a question for our wonderful speakers, please write them in the chat. Um, uh, I have colleagues online who will be uh, looking through those questions as we go through the evening. You're welcome to use the chat function for comments, chatting with each other. And also if you have any technical issues, uh, please just yell out in the chat. Uh, we will also be recording this meeting and there are live transcriptions that you can use in Zoom. So let's get into it. Uh, today we're here to learn about and celebrate the wonderful, the beautiful creature that is the platypus. I'm really happy to be joined today by two incredible platypus experts, Dr. Gilad Bino and Dr. Jessica Thomas. And we have two beautiful platypus champions online as well. Helen Tom Thompson, give a wave, Helen, um, is a community group leader uh, from the ACF group in Chisholm and our very own Jace Jess Abrahams, who's the ACF's nature uh, campaigner. First, we're going to hear from Gilad and Jessica. They're going to talk to us about the fascinating creature that is the platypus. Jess is going to talk to us about uh, the breeding habits. And Gilad's going to talk to us about the threats that they face. Then we're going to go to a Q&A. The Q&A is going to come from the questions you put in the chat. Um, so any questions that you have for these guys, get going with that. After we hear from, um, from the community, we'll, we'll hear from Jess and Helen about the Platy Project, why we're here tonight. We're going to learn about what we learned from 2022, how to get the most of, out of this month of action, and what you're going to do next. We'll hopefully get to another round of Q&A, and then we'll wrap up about 7.30. So first up, let's welcome Dr. Jessica Thomas. Jess is a platypus specialist based at Hillsville Sanctuary. She completed her PhD in the breeding biology of the platypus and has worked for Zoos Victoria for 15 years. Jess, take it away. Thank you. Um, I think the platypus just has the most interesting breeding biology. They tend to do everything just a little bit different to everybody else, which I think is one of the things that I love about them the most. 
So the breeding season, I feel like it it, it takes them all year um, because the process is so long. So I tend to think of it starting usually in about May. Um, and this is mostly for the males when their testosterone increases. And this is when they start to establish those territories. They start swimming up and down uh, all over the place, looking for territories that have lots of females living within them. It's also when they start to encounter other males um, and they will fight with them over these territories. Uh, so the male platypus has venomous spurs on their back feet, um, which they'll use as a weapon uh, when they do engage with other males. Now, the idea is that the biggest and strongest male will win the fight, and then he will get, then get the territory which has the most females living within it. So when it comes time to, to breed for the female, her job is really easy in selecting a male. The males have already fought with each other, and so the one that is there is the biggest and strongest and should therefore give her the healthiest offspring, in theory. Um, then the female isn't actually ready to go through courtship and mating with the male until around September, October. It varies a little bit depending on where you find the platypus. Um, the start and end of the, the breeding season is a little bit different across the states. But the courtship process um, between them is really quite interesting. Uh, they go through what I think of as a dance. And this is where the male will approach the female and he'll bite her on the end of the tail. And then she slowly turns around and bites him on the end of the tail. And then they swim around in a circle joined together on the surface of the water, um, swimming around in this, this beautiful circle. They'll also do twists and turns all over the place um, through this. And they can spend anywhere from a few days um, up to a few weeks going through this courtship dance. Now, normally in other species, the courtship process is a way that the male and female can get to know each other. Um, not really sure. I still have a lot of questions about what this process means in the platypus, about what they might qualities might they might be assessing in each other. Uh, but after the courtship process um, and the animals have mated, that's when the male is done. He will go off and he'll just feed and feed because he's been very busy over the last few months establishing those territories. Um, so he will just go and feed um, and, and take it easy for until the breeding season comes around again. Uh, but this is where it all starts for the female. So gestation um, is only a couple of weeks. It's about 16 days. And during that time, she needs to create a special nesting burrow where she's going to lay her eggs and raise her young. Now, the nesting burrow is really important for the female platypus because it needs to function the same way that a pouch does for a marsupial. It needs to be the right temperature. It needs to be the right humidity because she lives in the water where it's really cold and she also breathes air. She can't take her babies with her. So she needs to leave them somewhere safe while she goes to feed. Now, the way they collect nesting material is they swim around through the water and they collect things like leaves and grasses in their bills and then tuck them under their body into their tail, which turns into a hook. And then they drag all that nesting material underground into the burrow where they form a bit of a nest that I think looks a little bit like a possum dray. Um, and then once she's ready to lay her eggs, she'll go underground um, and they can lay up to three eggs, but one or two is more common. Uh, she incubates them for about 10 days. And then when they hatch, they're just tiny little jelly bean sized baby platypus. Um, and then these little babies are going to feed on her milk for the next four months um, until they're ready to emerge and look after themselves. Um, now, because they are left in the nest, the mum will spend most of her time there while they're really little, and then she'll spend more and more time out in the water away from them um, as they get ready to emerge. Now, if you think that was easy, that's not the case, because by the time the babies emerge, they can be up to 80% of the size of their mum. So they're huge. So if you think um, in that last month of lactation, she needs to be feeding two uh, baby platypus that are almost the same size that she is just on her milk. So you can just imagine what her energy requirements are. So she will actually eat double what any other platypus would eat at that amount of time just to be able to produce that volume of milk for them. And once those babies emerge, which is around February, they'll enter the water and they're very independent. They can look after themselves straight away, find their own food, um, which is really quite amazing. And I still have so many more questions. That's just the surface. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. My pleasure. And can we have a shout out to Platypus Mummies? Because that really sounds pretty full on. Um, get your questions in the chat if you've got questions for Jessica. I'm sure you do. There's so much more to know about platypuses. Platypuses. I'm still not used to saying that. 
Um, okay, we're now going to hear from Dr. Gilad Bino, a conservation ecologist at the Centre for Ecosystem Science at the University of New South Wales. Gilad has dedicated his research career to understanding how humans are impacting biodiversity and raising awareness of the conservation crisis we are causing. Gilad formed the Platypus Conservation Initiative seven years ago with the aim to improve knowledge and conservation of the platypus through research and education. Tonight, he will talk to us about the threats that our little, little furry friends are facing and the suspected population decline that they have suffered. Thanks, Gilad. Hey, thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you to everyone that joined us online. I'm you know, really encouraged by the amount of interest and participation by so many people that are, I think really um, really represents, I guess, the iconic nature of platypuses and how important wildlife are to us. And we just need to be reminded of the, you know, the unique animals that we coexist on this amazing country. Um, and so obviously platypuses are, uh, you know, such an icon. We see their paintings, drawings, logos almost anywhere we go. Um, and, and it's really because of their really unique feature. I mean, the, um, platypuses are dependent on freshwater environments. Uh, they need healthy systems like healthy creeks, uh, running water. They're de highly dependent on macroinvertebrates, like the, what we call like water bugs or the spineless water bugs, um, all the fly larvae and nymph stages in the water. So they really need healthy waterways, clean water, unpolluted water. But they're also very dependent on the riparian vegetation. So the ve vegetation that lines are rivers and creeks, um, because they, like Jess was saying, they need to build their burrows and they're highly dependent on being able to build burrows for their nests. So they need stable earthen banks and they need that riparian vegetation to hold that in place. And, and unfortunately, if that becomes destabilized, um, they can erode, but also they're really dependent on healthy catchments. So the, their, you know, the health of the rivers extend beyond just the local area. It extends to the whole catchment in terms of, if you were thinking about the impacts of sedimentation and siltation. So they really need healthy catchments to ex coexist. And so they need a healthy terrestrial as well as healthy freshwater systems. Um, platypuses ex extend, they have a really wide distribution all the way from far north Queensland, all the way down to Tassie. They inhabit kind of our semi-arid western flowing rivers to up to the alpine reaches. And so we really see them across a wide range of habitats and they're really adapted well to the natural in uh, environment and variability of Australia. But unfortunately, they're impacted by so many threatening processes that we're imposing on them, um, all the way from yeah, habitat clearing, river regulation, degradation of um, riparian vegetation, siltation, like I mentioned, er erosion and filling up of rivers that really interact with other threatening processes, like climate change, increased frequency and severity of droughts, and even invasive species. So all of these are now interacting with each other. And what unfortunately we're seeing is that in some areas we've lost our platypuses. Um, and so we're seeing local extinctions and we're seeing declines across their range. Um, their conservation status in terms of how we uh, consider how threatened they are. So they're endangered in South Australia. They're all but, but gone from the mainland. And they've been in 2021 listed as a threatened species in Victoria. Uh, but they're not listed anywhere else. And unfortunately, they're still not getting the attention that they really need. And so there's no national monitoring framework or even state level monitoring. And so when we did this assessment and we approached the Threatened Species Scientific Committee to try and designate the platypus as a threatened species, the response was that there's not enough data. But unfortunately, there's no monitoring. And so we're kind of in this endless loop. And uh, we really, really need the support of the wider community really to help us keep track and understand how we're impacting platypuses and how they're faring. Are they still around where we have past records? There are still many areas where we really don't know if the platypuses exist. So there's kind of this potential area, but we don't have any understanding. And so we really need your help um, to monitor and evaluate how platypuses are doing. And so the Platy Project is really a product of that. It, it's a way for us to really uh, highlight areas where we need help uh, the most. Um, and so that is really dependent on 
when was the last observation seen um, in that area of a platypus. And so we really need people to have a look at the planning project, project and have a look at those, like, those classifications and identify those areas where platypuses haven't been seen in over a decade or even more, or maybe there's no record at all, but it is a potential area. So those are really the priority areas. All those green bits that you see on the map, those are areas where we're confident that platypuses are still um, around. Obviously, we're, we're not being able to track change over time. We need to, that's a, a different process altogether. But we really need to better understand the distribution of platypuses to try and better quantify changes over time and as well as um, extend our understanding in terms of how we've been impacting the environment. But I think also this kind of process of getting out there, having a look for platypuses, uh, engaging with the local community, organizing all of these kinds of events and, and things like that are um, really important for us to be motivated to take care, um, better care of our environment and taking care of our um, you know, country and appreciating this amazing wildlife and biodiversity that we have all around us and we're so dependent on it. And so really, you know, I hope this uh, motivates all of you to go out and give us uh, a help that we really need. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Gilad. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for your leadership on this project over the years. It's just been wonderful to be guided by your wealth of knowledge. So thank you for being here again. Um, we have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So um, we're going to open up the floor to you guys, to the community, um, to ask Jessica and Gilad any questions. Um, over to you, Lena. Uh, what have you got for us? Thanks, Carly. Um, quite a few questions. We might not be able to get through all of them tonight, but um, a few for Jessica on the very fascinating breeding habits of the platypus. Um, first one is do from, from Jana. Um, does various temperature around Australia influence their mating, moving, and hibernation? Um, is it a seasonal difference between, for example, Queensland and Canberra? And um, how what happens with the non-alpha males? Helen would like to know, do they still get to breed for the season? Okay, so is there a seasonal difference between the breeding times across Australia? And sorry, could you repeat the question about the males? Uh, the non-alpha males, do they still get to breed or do they miss out? There you go. Yeah, good question. Um, there is a, a difference um, across the different states um, and you, you find this uh, the same in a lot of other species as well. Um, so because they're found all the way up into the northern Queensland and then all the way down into the very cold Tasmania, the start of the breeding season does vary a little bit depending on where you locate them. Um, so Tasmania tends to start much later than everybody else and then you get much earlier up in Queensland and I say everywhere else because I'm in Victoria so I consider that to be normal um, but that's not the case that's just my own mind um, so yes Queensland tends to start first and then and then Tasmania starts a little bit oh. later on um, in terms of the uh, non the non-winners you know, we're not really sure. Um, they could just skulk off and with their tail between their legs, I guess, and um, and wait until it's their turn. Or, um, which is the case in some other species, is you get a little bit of some sneaky male action and they might come out during the day um, and catch some females out during the day or they um, they just work out where the, the big male is and, and sort of avoid where he is because if he's got lots of females in his territory, it's really hard to be across all of that and trying to court with all of those females as well. So I'm sure there's a little bit of sneaky subordinate male going on there. Brilliant. Uh, Lena, any more questions? Yeah, quite a lot. Um, let's go a few more for Jessica and then go over to Gillard. Um, Jessica, do the new young females stay in their original home range um, and only young males move out? And I really would like to know. And um what are other options for safe breeding and personal created environments to help save the species while we are facing local extinction? That might be one for both of you. I'll, um, I'll answer the, um, oh, I've forgotten what the first question was, sorry, already. <laughs> uh, that was the one where the, do the, like, do they stay together? Uh, or do they move? Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually this is, um, 
This is my main question that I have in my mind at the moment, and it's one of my current research projects. Um, so in the stream that I study at the moment, um, there's actually a reasonably high juvenile female retention rate. So the, the young females seem to be hanging around um, in the same territory that they were born into um, for multiple years. Um, obviously, there's some that I haven't recaptured. Um, the male retention rate within the area is much lower though. So we think the males disperse um, a lot more quickly than what the females do, but it's likely not to be until they're at least a year old. Um, in the stream that I, st I study right here in Hillsville, um, there's one juvenile male that I actually captured seven years ago as a juvenile um, and I caught him again last year. Um, and he's now the big male in the area. I'm just so proud of him. Um, he was such an interesting male to track um, back then too. He went all over the place and he came out during the day. So I actually wonder if that's one of the reasons why he's managed to stay in that territory because he decided he could be diurnal. Hmm. I'll read out the, the next one. So the second one that Lena said was, what are the options for safe breeding in person created environments to help save the species while we are facing local extinctions? So by person created environments, like a zoo? I guess so. Yes. Um, so if I take a, a person created environment um, as, as like Hillsville Sanctuary, um, so the, yeah, there's lots of components um, that you need there. Um, really good water quality um, is one main factor, obviously, because the female needs to eat so much food to support her lactation. If you don't have the food there um, for her to be able to nourish herself properly, breeding's going to be unsuccessful. Um, that bank st stability that um, Gilad was talking about, so having a really good earth bank that's consolidated with a lot of uh, native plants and vegetation is also really important because if that nesting burrow collapses or, um, or floods or has anything happen to it, well, the young have no chance of survival at all. So I think those are probably the main two features that, um, that any environment needs to have for successful breeding. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, I guess, you know, some, some studies that Jess has been doing and, and recently we have also um, in terms of like an, an understanding the, the breeding requirements for platypuses in terms of the burrows. So there's a difference between a nesting and a resting burrow. So platypuses rest in like temporary or uh, burrows that they construct, which are closer to the bank, whereas the nesting burrows are still Jess has done amazing work. So I'm, you know, it's like, it's a credit for Jess for sure, okay. but I, I'm quoting Jess. Yeah. So, you know, um, but, but nesting burrows are much more complex structures that are often found higher up the bank. Um, and so um, they can extend up to 10 meters uh, from the, from the water um, edge. So, you know, quite high. And so if you think about what are the requirements for, for, um, for breeding of platypuses, they need riparian vegetation that goes a fair bit up. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, and also, I guess, to, just to watch out when you're now doing surveys over the coming months and things like that. So, you know, really trample with care if you're going into like areas where the riparian vegetation, sometimes you, you there is a risk. We've seen like cattle, particularly, they can collapse burrows. And so that's something of concern. So if you're, you know, so tread lightly if you're uh, making your way around the, the creeks. That's interesting. That leads into another question from Karen. Um, do you think that if the public map is too detailed showing where the platypuses are at, um, it might attract unwanted attention or too many people going to those places? Uh, yeah, that's something that people raise a lot. I think so. First of all, uh, there's I don't think I don't think so. I think that it's great to see where people are making those sightings. And I think we should all appreciate like the wildlife around us, but but do that in a very respectful manner. So we you know we don't go out there and try and catch platypuses or touch them. And we're not trying to interfere with them. And obviously, we're very respectful of like where those observations were made. And if they're on private property, so we're not going to start jumping off fences and, you know, and venturing into areas without asking for proper permission. So I don't think there's a risk. I think I think it would the more people that go out there and go out into nature in a very respectful manner, the better it is for you know for our well-being and for appreciating the you know the amazing uh, country that we live on. Actually, I might have something to add to that. Um, you know, I always think um, working at Hillsville Sanctuary, people always want to see a platypus, but I always think of them as a species that's only ever seen by those that are patient. 
You know, they're, they're a species that's designed not to be seen. They're, they camouflage with their environment and this is how they survive. They're little brown animals that live in a brown habitat and they spend their time underwater and underground and they're also nocturnal. So we as humans are not really designed to see them. We're not really compatible with their environment, which is why we need your help on this. And, um, you know, you, you do need to be patient and sit there and look. Um, so I think I think people that don't have good intentions are perhaps not going to be patient enough to uh, to actually see one at all. Yeah, I can vouch for that. I've been in Hillsville for six years and I've been platypus spotting 10 times. And have I seen a platypus? I have not. No. <laughs> this year, hopefully. Uh, Lena, any more questions from the amazing group we have in the Zoom room? We have quite a few questions around what we can do locally to improve our riverways um, in the countryside, but also as city people. Um, are there certain plants that we can plant, um, water quality we can improve? What can we do locally to protect our beautiful platypuses? Great question. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll start. Um, yeah. Um, so I think it really depends on the, so like that's the answer. The answer to this question is like a big one. But I think, first of all, um to like have a think about like step out from your wherever you're living and think about what you can do for your local creek and river and so if you're on rural property and you've got cattle there that are trampling over the banks or you don't have any repair and vegetation how think about like oh can i put a fence can i prevent cattle can i restore the environment um can i replant do i reach out to my local land care group that have the expertise have the knowledge have the network and so you know that that's kind of probably the steps you need to take but but beyond that like we need to like get together to do these and so the the issue at hand it extends far beyond just us and so restoring the environment the ecosystem is something that we need to do as a community and that community extends sometimes like what i said in earlier in terms of like thinking about the, the our creek and how what are the what's impacting the creek and so i think caring for country is a way for us to get together and start thinking about how we collectively work together to improve our environments and so again in terms of like trying to minimize erosion at the catchment scale um trying to restore environments thinking about also in terms of rigor regulation and and uh, fragmentation of habitats and things like that and barriers and so there's also motivation that that we need to um initiate on on the political level so you know our local representatives need to know that we care about these issues and they need to want to do that so without our support they're not going to think that that's a priority and so we need to also work on that and 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 also uh like if you have the capacity support these land care initiatives or any community events either with your time or if you want to like uh donate so you know there there's plenty of opportunities to help yeah, those are great. And um, I guess I, I see a little bit of a different side because we have a wildlife hospital. Um, the animals that uh, typically get brought in, um, they're all preventable, which is the most heartbreaking part of it all. Uh, the majority of the injured animals that come in are entangled in rubbish. Um, so I think if you're looking for just something really simple that you can do every day, it's you see something on the ground, um, pick it up and pop it in the bin. Like it sounds so simple, doesn't it? We were taught it in primary school. Um, but, you know, when you walk past some rubbish, it rains, it's going to wash into the stormwater drain. It's going to end up into the creek with the platypus. And they're so inquisitive. Um, you know, something you think, why would you go near that? They'll go near it because it's different. Um, and they always get stuck around their necks. And by the time they come to us, um, you know, we do the best we can. But a lot of the times there's not much we can do at that point. Um, and the other really preventable thing, the other thing we see all the time is actually um, dog attacks. And I say attacks, but they're not from feral dogs um, because it's all in urban areas. They're pet dogs, um, you know, and uh, I'm someone I walk my dog along the creek as well. But if it's dawn or dusk, um, I actually always make sure they're on a lead because I think what happens in these cases is, you know, Fluffy bounces into the river, grabs the platypus, shakes it, kills it or injures it, bounces back to you and you've got no idea that it even happened. So it's like the most purest intentions, um, but it's actually been catastrophic for the platypus. So if you're a pet owner and you like to walk your dog, please still do so. Um, but just be conscious of the activity period of a platypus. Um, and if it's around those times that they're starting to emerge, particularly in the evening, just pop your dog on a lead. Yeah. 
Thank you. Really practical tips from both of you. That was really great. Uh, Lena, do we have time? We have time for one more question. If there's uh, one you'd like to raise. Yeah, great. Um, a few questions around how to spot one. What's the best time to go out to spot? What are like signs to be looking out for at a creek? Um, how do I know that I'm actually so sort of platypus? Here we go. How do we spot a platypus and not a logopus? <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would tell me how to find one. <laughs> no, but, um, as I said, they're, de they're designed not to be seen. And um, and like yourself, I guess, I've even been one step further and I've been radio tracking one and the signal tells me it's out in the river at the time that I'm looking for it. And I cannot for the life of me see it, but the signal tells me it's right there. Um, so I've been equally as frustrated as to not see them. Um, I think the main thing is to be patient, find a spot, don't move around too much because um, that when they're on the surface, they do have their eyes open. And if they do see you moving around and, you, and you're a bit close, that might frighten them um, and they may not want to come up near you. So I'd say just have a seat. Um, usually the telltale sign that I see is the bubble trail. Um, so the, the platypus has actually got two really thick layers of fur. Um, and when they groom themselves, they trap a layer of air in that fur and it's all part of the waterproofing. But it means when they dive, you get a little bit of bubbles releasing through that fur. Um, and that's, I reckon, the the main tip to, to seeing them and then just wait and then you might see one pop up. That's my tip. How do you find that one? Um, no, so a bit spiritual. No, I'm kidding. But uh, <laughs> no, but it really, um, no, I mean, obviously there's the timing and all that, but I think try and make that, don't come in with like anxious, I want to see a platypus. I think take that as an experience. So, and, and like, just as be patient. So bring a friend, bring a, a like a camp camping chair, bring something to drink or like a warm cup of tea or coffee, if it's in the morning or in the evening, whatever you want. And, but take the opportunity, not just to try and spot a platypus, but take the opportunity to actually soak in that natural environment and listen to the sounds and look at the sights and and look at the other animals and plants that are, are all around us and then yes the hopefully a platypus will appear in front of you and um, and grace grace you with their presence beautiful thanks for that um and if you do need more tips on how to spot a platypus acf have got lots of materials on this and um, our buddies in the chat will drop some links in all right, so thank you for all those questions and your brilliant answers. Um, it's time for us to move on to hear a lot more about the actual Platy project. We've started on that subject already and how it helps platypuses and how you can get involved. So we're gonna hear now from Jess Abrahams, uh, ACF's national nature campaigner. Many of you are gonna know Jess from uh, being the head of Platy Month last year, and he's been with ACF for a long time. So you'll probably recognize him. Uh, thanks for being here with us, Jess. Uh, we're excited to hear all about the project and the context of the Save Our Big Backyard campaign. Um, over to you. Thanks, Carly. Um, and so great to hear um, Gilad and Jessica, your wisdom shining through. As many of you probably have heard me say before, um, nature in Australia is in trouble. And uh, it's, it's a serious trouble. You know, we're in the midst of an extinction crisis. Um, Australia has caused the extinction, or colonial Australia has caused the extinction of more than 100 unique Australian plants and animals. We're amongst, amongst the worst in the world for extinction. Um, more than 2,000 unique plants and animals are currently threatened with extinction. And that, that list is growing constantly. I'm constantly in the media talking about the latest thing, latest species that's been added to that list. And it's pretty heartbreaking. Um, once common species like the koala, um, even they're endangered. And I, I might have heard me say this anecdote before, but as a kid, uh, my grandfather had a farm and there was koalas in the trees in the Yarra Valley and there was just no big deal. And I remember early on in my environmental career 20 years ago, someone said to me, you guys should be campaigning on, you know, to protect the koala. They, they'll be endangered one day. And I, I literally laughed. I said, there's no way that could happen. Um, but yet, you know, last year, in fact, this year, koalas were added to um, the threatened species list in the endangered category. We don't want the platypus to become the next koala. Um, this incredible creature, it's so mysterious, it's so iconic, um, it features, as, as Gil had said, on our currency, in our kind of cultural mythology, and yet the, 
the platypus too is in decline. Um, we know that um, the platypus has disappeared from, I, I understand, an area about 22% of its range. Now that's an area three times the size of Tasmania. That's a, that's a massive area. I'm, I'm lucky enough to have had a few close encounters with platypus because I used to be a ranger in Tasmania. Um, and one of my most um, memorable encounters was seeing a platypus not in a stream, but actually on a walking track, walking towards me. And I was literally just like, what is that thing waddling down the path? Oh, that's a platypus. Um, thankfully, it seems that in Tasmania, platypus are in pretty good um, numbers. But, you know, throughout other parts of Australia, platypus are absolutely in decline. Now, um, we want to make sure, as I said, that, um, you know, platypus don't become the next threatened species. And um, we were very proud to partner with um, Gilad and UNSW in submitting that um, initial nomination to the Threatened Species Scientific Committee for the platypus to be a threatened species. And as I like said, you know, the information is just not there to determine whether or not the species sort of meets the criteria of decline. And, and that's really where the Platy Project was born, is this idea of capturing the data that's needed to make the case to give the platypus the protection it deserves. But in addition to um, you know, the science. The Platy Project is also about people. It's about engaging Australians who love nature but probably haven't been active in protecting it um, before. And, you know, ACF is very good, you know, talking to a cohort of um, people who are perhaps, you know, pretty confident being activists. But um, there's a whole group of Australians out there and we're meeting them through the Platy Project, people who are part of rotary groups and lions groups and scouts groups and city councils and um, a whole range of sort of un unlikely allies are joining us um, on the Platy Project. And that's really exciting for us because this project is part of a bigger campaign to, as the sign says behind Carly, to save our big backyard. Um, and that campaign has a really ambitious goal, and it's a goal in line with a global goal. And that is that by the end of this decade, by the end of 2030, we've arrested the decline in nature and we've actually restored nature and nature is, you know, on a path to recovery that there's, you know, nature is in better health by the end of the decade than it is by the start of the decade. Um, there's obviously a long way to go to get there, um, but the Platy Project does play a small part in that. Um, we're really proud of what the Platy Project achieved last year. Um, we had over 860 um, platypus spotted um, from far north Queensland all the way down to Tasmania. Um, we had more than 50 community events. Um, we had nearly 90, more than 90 ally organisations. But what the, some statistics that I'm really proud of is that, and, and Gilad's incredible map, if you haven't logged onto the Platy Project map, like get on there and explore it. It's really extraordinary. You know, what we've managed to do with this map is identify that there are 59 places, and these are 10 by 10 kilometer grids, where platypus were seen last year in the Platy Project, where they hadn't been seen for more than a decade. Like that's really remarkable. Like we are showing that platypus are turning up in places they haven't been seen. And perhaps more impressive is that there are 45 of these locations, 10 by 10 grids, where platypus had not been seen. There was no recorded record of a platypus. And we, through the Platy Project, through our partnership with the community and, and UNSW, have shown that platypus do exist there. So that's really exciting. I'm really proud of that. Look, there's so much we don't know about platypus, um, but we do know that you know, nature in Australia is in trouble and we all need to take action. It's communities, it's governments and also businesses need to play a part too. Um, I'll talk to you more um, after uh, later in the webinar about the sorts of actions that you can take. Um, but I think what I'll do now is I'd love to um, hear for you all to hear from um, Helen. Helen Thompson um, is a really amazing ACF community leader. She is part of our Chisholm ACF community group. And um, as some of you may know, you might not, we have um, fantastic ACF community groups all around the country who are um, organising to take part in um, ACF Save Our Big Backyard and many of our other campaigns as well and, and you know, get involved in our community group community groups. Helen joined Chisholm Community Group in 2018 and she's been active ever since. She's done a huge number of things. She's organised events, she's door knocked for elections um, and last year she organised um, a Platy 
platypus spotting event and she saw a platypus in the wild. Hey, how about that? So um, let's hear from Helen. Um, let's, I'll pass to you. Okay. Yes, me and many others organised. I'm just one of many. Um, I'll just tell you briefly, when I went to school a long time ago, we learned to spell. My favourite word was O-R-N-I-T-H-O-R-H-Y-N-C-H-U-S. And it stayed with me, Ornithorhynchus, the scientific family name for platypus. Anyway, last year, I was involved in the ACF Melbourne Community Group's platy launch at Mullum Mullum Creek in Doncaster East. The Mullum Mullum Creek runs into the Yarra between Warrandyte and Eltham, outer bush suburbs of Melbourne, where platypus have lived for centuries. How do we set up? A group of us went to the selected area to look for suitable viewing sites and to check that the creek could be a possible home for platypus. Nice banks to make nests and no concrete lined stretches and to check car parking, toilets, a suitable place to gather. <clears throat> At the time, the creek was flowing well due to heavy winter rain in 2022 and the last sighting in that area was 2020. The banks looked healthy and suitable for platypus by our novice estimation. We thought we had a good chance of seeing a platypus, possibly. We then had several trips back to Mullum Mullum to identify and map the viewing site so that we'd be able to direct people and attendees on the day. <clears throat> Some sites were more rugged, off track than others. And on the day, we placed markers at the sites to help us find our way. The day came, the weather was good. We arrived early, set up signs near the road to direct people and set up all the usual ACF stuff, you know, list to tick off, info sheets, promotional flyers for upcoming events. And we had 130 RSVPs, but only about 60 turned up. After the welcomes and instructions, what to look for, the groups were formed. Number one, who wants to go on an off-track site? A big group responded and off they went, very keen, squelching through long grass and over logs to find spots to sit. Who'd like to stand on the bridge? Who wants to sit on the bench seat, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. <clears throat> now I'd like to describe the scene. Groups of people sitting quietly and concentrating firmly on the creek flowing past, cameras poised in some cases. Not a word. This is the best part of platy spotting. Sitting at dusk in nature with only the birds making a noise here and there, or maybe a duck splashing some water. A dog walker passes on the track above or the odd cyclist racing home. And slowly, the sun goes down and the world is at peace. It's a beautiful time of day, soft light, and such a joy to sit and observe one of our waterways, a meditation in nature. <clears throat> Problem was, it was such a lovely, pleasant experience that when the time came to regroup and it was getting dark, <clears throat> excuse me, no one wanted to leave their posts. Eventually they did, and most reported no sightings. One person who lingered longer with a few others and had been watching bubbles saw a platypus dive and disappear. One sighting recorded, but no opportunity to photograph. And we all know that whatever the result of platy spotting, positive or negative, it's still a result. It provides valuable information. A few weeks later, ACF Chisholm Group organised a platy spotting event at Ruffy Creek near the Yarra at Lower Templestone. This area is close to houses and a main road and a big cafe. In previous high rainfall years, there were reported anecdotal sightings of platypus in the creek near the cafe. It was a wet, grey, overcast day, cold, lots of rain during the day and the previous night. Grey skies and still raining when we arrived to set up, four o'clock. Creek was flowing fast, plenty of water. By the time people turned up, many with children and all very keen, the rain had stopped, fortunately. We took a photo, headed out to our viewing spots at five o'clock in the damp grass and bushes. This area is near a popular walking cycling track and houses are close by. I had my doubts, but sit and observe in the quiet we did for almost an hour. Then the call came. We've seen a platypus downstream about 300 metres. We took off with our chairs and things and there it was, a platypus swimming, diving, surfacing in part of the creek 
with a banks of grass and onion weed, a concrete pipe nearby upstream that goes under the road. The creek didn't look particularly pristine. There was some rubbish, no doubt washed down from the gutters and the heavy rains. I think the platypus deserve better. Anyway, it was a big thrill for us all to see a live platypus swimming swiftly, leaving behind a characteristic V pattern in the water, diving straight down and popping up again nearby, disappearing for a while, tricking us. The children were so pleased and the adults quietly thrilled and many photos taken. <laughs> And they're able to watch the platypus for at least 10 minutes. So I would say get out there into nature, near a creek or river, enjoy the environment at dawn or dusk and look for platypus to help our scientists keep tabs on them. And take, take note of how fragile their environment is, their habitat. <clears throat> and I've noticed a lot of um, questions in the chat about what people can do and I think one of the best things you can do on a large scale <clears throat> is contact your federal politicians and Tanya Plibersek to strengthen our environmental laws. In times of low rainfall and extreme temperatures, where will the platypus go? And there's a photo <clears throat> of a family with kids and they came with chairs and covers and they've been pouring with rain for 24 hours. Anyway, that, that's, um, and I would, anyone who's organising a platy survey i'll direct you to the acf website and to look at the video how to do a platypus survey okay <laughs> brilliant thank you so much helen that really brought the experience of going platypus spotting to life for me um and i hope uh, that excited you all um we have some more time for questions uh, so I hope you've been dropping them in the chat. Now, if you would like to leave a question for Jess or for Helen specifically about the campaign or um, the Platy project, or also we still have the wonderful Gilad and Jessica here, so they will also be able to answer your questions. So Lena, anything from you? Well, we're all very keen to go platypus spotting and to see one, even so they're not designed to be seen by us. Um, so we still really would love to hear um, Elizabeth, Kylie, Tom and many others would like to know any other signs that can look out for a good river to maybe know if there would be a good spot to look for a platypus. So, for example, um, is there a certain depth that they prefer, certain plants they like to eat, so they're more likely to be next to that river away? Like it poop we can look for, like any other signs we can look that might help us to sit at the right spot and wait in the rain. How do we pick the exact right spot for a platypus? <laughs> okay. So first of all, also picking some of the not best looking rivers where historical records exist uh, is also important for us to like confirm the absence of platypuses. I know it might like, you know, um defeat the kind of the purpose of going out and trying to see a platypus but but we also need to know where platypuses don't exist obviously in terms of creeks and or areas where platypuses have been recorded 50 years ago to confirm their absence would be good um in the sense of better understanding how we're impacting our environment uh, in terms of like what are the best chances of seeing platypuses so like if running water deep relatively like at least in, i would say knee height ideally even like they love you know about like one or two meters deep pools they would love um to where they can forage they don't really like like big reservoirs sometimes on the edges they do um and they really what you want to see is like these overhanging riparian vegetation clear water unpolluted water where you can actually also try and have a look for water bugs as an indication of like food availability for platypuses so those are some of the tail signs for for good platypus habitat yeah i i would agree um you know the white water of a riffle um it's really hard to see them i've only see them go through the riffle if i've spotted them in the still pool first and then i can watch them but if i didn't know it was there i would never have seen it um, I also think, yeah, you're right with the still pools are the best place because that's actually where they spend their time. So they're going to hang out there, spend a reasonable amount of time there. So you're going to see them pop up and chew on the surface because that's what you're going to see is them chewing. Um, and then they'll dive down, pick up some more bugs, come back up, take a breath, chew their food up. Um, so the pools tend to be, you know, the, the dining table, um, whereas I feel like the riffles are just the highways. It's how you get to another dining table. 
Um, so if they're just moving between them, you probably, it's unlikely you're going to be sitting at the exact spot or just as they happen to move there. So I'd say, yeah, I vote for sit a pool, a still pool. Good tips. Uh, Lena, anything more? Yes, many more questions. Um, one question around if I don't have anyone else to go with, how can I find other people to go bloody spotting with if I don't feel comfortable going alone? And another question around if I saw one, how do I actually put that information in? And if I saw one in 2007, can I still put that information into the map? So, can I, can yes. I jump in with an answer to some of those, Carly? Go for it, Jess. Um, so that I love the question about if you wanted to go with someone else. Um, if you log on to the Platy Project map, you can see um, some blue pins on the map. And if you click on a blue pin, it's an event. It's a Platy spotting event um, that someone else is hosting. And you can RSVP to join them on that event. And going in a big group and spreading out along the riverbank, perhaps you've actually got more chance of someone in the group seeing a platypus. And like Helen described, um, then, you know, calling the the group down hey there's a platypus in this pool further down so the platy project map is a great way to find people there we go we're zooming in is a great way to find out an event um, even better, you could host your own event um, and get people to come and join you at your event. Um, and it's really easy to host an event on the website too. You literally just click the host an event button. Um, so that's that's the answer to the first question. Um, I'll keep going. Um, you can record your sightings on the map. Um, there is a record a sighting button on the map. Um, and it gives you, you just literally, it opens a window on the side and you fill in the details. You can also record a non-sighting. And as I think Gilad was describing, you know, a non-sighting, which gives you not a blue circle, but a um, hollow blue circle or blue outline with a white inside um, is a place where someone has looked for platypus, but been unsuccessful. And so the map is color coded and, you know, Gilad will can talk to this in much more detail, but the most recent sightings are blue and those green squares are places where platypus have been seen most recently. Um, the darker the color from yellow to orange to red, um, places where they've been not seen for longer. And then that sort of gray color is places that are believed to be in the platypus range, but platypus have not been sighted there. Did I answer all those questions? Yeah, and you can record a past sighting. Is that correct, Gilad? Yes, very much in, encouraged. I mean, you know, so like a, a, even a vague year ish is is really good for us. So, you know, it's like, oh, I remember I was on a school trip 30 years ago and it was like, you know, whenever 1970 something, then I saw a platypus. So even things like that. And like, even if you don't remember the exact month, but it's like, oh, it must have been like maybe September, October or something like that. That's fine for us. Um, and, and those kind of observations are really helpful, but make sure that it lets you write a bit of that description so we can then when we're doing kind of like a quality assurances, if we need to like verify things, we can follow through with that. Um, and then even even having a conversation with like, depending on your age, but even having a conversation with your parents or your grandparents, if you're visiting, you know, you're going to country and uh, having a chat with your grandparents and they tell you that actually, yes, we you remember seeing platypuses back then or, you know, things like that. Even those kind of observations are really important because unfortunately, through a bit of work that we've been doing, looking at historical newspaper records, extending even a hundred years and back in time, like there's been a shift in like our collective memory without any data in terms of like what we've been doing to the environment. And so even recording those kind of observations would be really helpful. So thank you very much. And Helen, like you really warmed the hearts with that description. It's like, it's such a pleasure to know that you know we're able to reach out to all of you out there and and um, and get people like 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 minded people motivated to you know to care for country so it's yeah thank you like it's such a pleasure to you know um, collaborate and work with you all so thank you so much Thank you. And yes, I'd like to shout out to everyone in our ACF community groups who just do such an amazing job, such an important part of our community and really uh, do a lot in the Platy project and host so many events. So to all the community groups out there, thank you so much. Lena, do we, we probably have time for another question before we start to wrap up. One more question. I okay, think so. Cool. One more question. Good, good for me to know. Um, sorry, guys, that we couldn't get to all of your questions tonight. 
last question what is the impact we all can have together like if this project goes well Jess and Gillard what are we hoping to achieve with it and you go first Jess I was going to defer to Gillard I guess um you know the ultimate goal would be to gather enough data to determine whether or not platypus are in fact a threatened species is that is that a fair assessment Gillard is that is that would that be the ultimate goal of this project do you think we can get there with this with the information we're gathering it, my ultimate goal is for all of us to mobilize together and really care for our environment and care about our waterways and so if we can get enough people to care we can really change and create change and create positive change so we're trying to like you're saying Jess we we want to stop uh you know the impacts that we're having on biodiversity we don't want to see any more species uh, um, disappearing from Australia and and on a personal like for us the way that we experience the environment is is personal in the sense that if a platypus disappears if platypuses disappear from our local river then that for us is an extinction that is for us is the loss of platypuses and so we've seen that happen and we've seen many communities lose the platypuses in their local river and creek and so you know that's their personal experience and loss and so we really want to avoid that and we really want to care you know people to care about platypuses and, and freshwater species and 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 beyond that about biodiversity because we're so dependent on it for our well-being so it's you know beyond measure um and but you know on a practical level we want to like be able to be accurately have the capacity to accurate accurately assess how platypuses are tracking and and whether um you know we're how we're impacting the environment and 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 actually have enough data to actually go um, and provide a, a robust assessment of how they're doing and if they do need to be federally listed as a threatened species then we have the appropriate data to support that so yeah so thank you again thank you so much um look we're getting towards time so i'm gonna just hand over to jess one more time to tell us what everybody needs to do for platy month Good one. Thanks, Carly. So there's a few things, a um, few simple steps. If you haven't already signed up on our website, um, please like go ahead and do that. That's probably the first important step. Um, second step, I reckon, and I've sort of mentioned this already, is host an event. Um, you might be part of an ACF community group. You don't have to be, though. You could just be an individual um, with a bunch of mates um, and you put it up on the internet on our web on our you know, interactive map and you might attract some new friends or you know neighbors who want to come play to push spotting with you even if you don't do a formal event on our website just getting a few people together to go platy spotting with you and spread out along a local waterway um, would be a really fantastic thing to do um, of course we would love you third thing is to um, share this project you know talk to your friends and family your work colleagues um, tell people about the platy project because we want as many people um, from far north queensland to you know, the southern tasmania as west as you know south australia to participate in this project so they're the three key things i really would em encourage everyone to do there's one more special um, act thing that you can do and it's a new feature of our website um, which um, hopefully we will have lots of people do this year um, is to actually share your sighting once you've recorded or logged a sighting is then send a message to your mp about what you've just seen in nature. And it's a chance for you to do a personal and perhaps detailed message about whether you've seen a platypus or not, your um, concerns and about the state of nature and your desire for it to see it protected and restored because the federal government this year um, is creating um, a new national environment laws. It's a once in a decade opportunity. Um, they need to feel the demands of the community for, uh, for strong laws that will actually meet the test of protecting and restoring nature. So, um, you know, I guess the last thing I'd say is get active, get politically active. Thanks, Carly. Back to you. Awesome. Thank you, Jess. All right, guys, you've got your homework. So before we finish, I just want to thank our guests today. Dr. Jessica Thomas, thank you so much for being here. And Dr. Gilad Bino, thank you so much for being here as well. Thank you to Helen Thompson for sharing that beautiful story of platy platy spotting. And also thanks to Jess Abrahams for being an awesome campaigner. 
Um, we are going to end tonight's webinar with two short videos. They're about five minutes in total. The first message is from Gina Chick. You may have heard of her. She was out in the wilderness in Tassie uh, relatively recently. Um, it's a three minute, it's a couple of minutes, um, just a bit of a G up about Platy Month. And then stick around for a three minute explainer, which is everything you need to know about how to get out there and uh, spot some platypus uh, this September. So we're going to close the meeting at the end of those two videos. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful Platy Month. Thank you so much for all being here with, with us this evening. And get out there, enjoy nature, and hopefully see some of these beautiful creatures. Thank you. One of the greatest gifts of my time in Lutruwita, Tasmania, was my regular visits from that most incredible of creatures, the platypus. The local Palawa people call it Lurila. And my daily interactions with Lorela the platypus were not only captivating, but they also helped me feel a lot less alone. But the platypus is under threat and needs all of our help. With that in mind, the Australian Conservation Foundation is running the Platy Project this September. If you live near a creek or a river, just go hang out near the bank really quietly and see if you can spot a platypus and record everything about it. This will help researchers not only understand this elusive creature a little better, but also find better ways to protect it. It's a matter of survival for one of our most loved animals. Are you up for the challenge? One of the greatest gifts of my time I'm Amy. I work for the Australian Conservation Foundation and I'm going to be taking you through some key ingredients to run a successful platypus survey. Let's get started. To begin, I looked at the Platy Project map to find a location where platypus have been spotted before, but not for a while. Instructions on how to use the map are on the website. I checked the site was on Crown land with good parking and accessibility. Don't visit places on private property unless you know the owner and have their permission. Here are a few handy things you can pack to make the experience as comfortable as possible. A phone, bring a notepad and some binos, wear some sturdy shoes. A water bottle, raincoat, warm jumper and a beanie are a must. A thermos of tea and some snacks are also handy. You can find all this useful information in the Platy Project Toolkit on our website. Remember, platys are most active around dawn and dusk, but if that's a bit too cold, choose the next most suitable time. Turns out, the site was brilliant, with a seat for comfort, a good view of the creek, a gentle slope between the bank and the creek, and an easy track to access. The site is at an old waterhole that have had platypus sightings in the past. After some simple and important planning, here we are with quiet anticipation. At the location, wondering what signs we're looking for in spotting a platy. Platypus are pretty unique, but don't be fooled. Their unique features are not what actually stand out. Platypus are quite fast, so what you want to look out for is the V trailing behind them and a little head at the top of the water. You should see that move along and then they'll dive down into the water. It's also worth keeping in mind the platypus will often resurface close to where they dove whereas other animals like the native water rat, the rakali, will resurface further away. While you're out looking for a platypus, it's important to record what you see so you can share this information with the experts. A photo captured on a phone, even at a distance, is great. Good gear like a DSLR camera or long lens can help too. If you do see a platypus, make sure you mark the location. You can use Google Maps on your phone. At a pinch, you can estimate it after. It's also useful to make notes of the things you notice, such as the movements of the platypus and vegetation along the way. To submit your sighting, visit the Platy Project website and upload what you have seen. Instructions for this can be found in the toolkit. Don't forget to attach a photo if you got one, location information, and to include any notes you've taken. If you were lucky enough to see a platypus and did get a photo, it's great to upload them to social media using the hashtag platyproject. Platypus are extremely elusive animals, 
so there's a good chance you might not see one. In fact, not seeing a platypus gives researchers valuable insights into platypus populations. Whether you did or didn't see a platypus when you went out, log that information via the map. And that's how you do it. Thanks for watching. We'd also love to hear about your encounters, so send us an email. Good luck out there.